I'd like to call this meeting of the Regional Transit Board meeting to um, order. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? Absolutely. Director Budge? Here. Director Harris? Here. Director Howell? Here. Director Hume? Here. Director Jennings? Here. Director Kennedy? Here. Director Miller? Here. Director Natoli? Here. Director Chenier is marked as being absent. Director Cerna? Here. Chair Hansen? Here. With that, we have a quorum at 100 votes. This meeting of the Sacramento Regional Transit District will be cable cast without interruption on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel. Tonight's meeting will air on February 12th at 9 a.m. and replayed on February 13th at 9 a.m. and will be webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. It is also closed captioned. Members of the audience wishing to address the board should fill out a speaker card located at the rear of the room and will have two minutes to speak. Speaker cards must be turned into the chair prior to the item being called by the clerk. Please provide your speaker card to me or Adam. Please speak into the microphone and state your name for the record. We would appreciate everyone turning off their cell phones. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite Rob Carrion from Operating Engineers Local 3 to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. All right, Madam Clerk, first item. First item is the consent calendar items 2.1 through 2.4, noting that you have speaker cards on items 2.3 and 2.4. Uh, thank you. Um, we'll take the public comment first, if that's okay with the board. The first speaker is Sarah Kerber from Sac True on item 2.3. <coughs> uh, Sarah, you also have a 2.4. Would you like to consolidate those? No. Okay. No, thank you. Um, Hello, my name is Sarah Kerber. I'm with the Sacramento Transit Riders Union. Um, <coughs> our members again request an update on the status of the Water 80 elevator replacement project. Uh, we hope the project will, um, we note that this board item is an update to the Watt I-80 station, and we hope that the public will again be included in the design concept, as it has been almost two years since uh, we were engaged in the project. Um, we see that part of the proposal in this item is to modify the stair and elevator structures at Watt I-80. As we noted in our comments to the board on May 12th, 2019, not only will the elevator modernization project improve the rider experience and accessibility for thousands of riders who use the station daily, um, but will also save SACRT from the costly $10,000 a day bus bridge needed to make sure that those riders can access all parts of the station. Funding was made available in the current budget for elevator replacement, and we hope that we can receive an update on how planning and progress is going. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Henry, can you provide an update on that for Ms. Kerber? It, may, it doesn't have to be now, but if you if you have an update. Actually, we send some uh, stuff back to you uh, okay. uh, today. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is Jeffrey Tardigia and item 2.3 as well. Again, Jeff Tardigia, and likewise, it is on that item of the elevator. Uh, the MAC was presented with, quote, some design for relating to poop shielding. Um, I'm hoping that this board in has a full, intense understanding of what is going on with the I-80 elevator and what other considerations that are transpiring and taking place. And again, even reading through the detail uh, of 2.3 doesn't really clarify for the public what is going on and what effective timetable, although I hear June now, um, you know, but this has been ongoing for quite some time. It would be nice if it does finish out in the fiscal year, but I'm highly suspicious that it will be next year before we will have any replacement on the I-80 elevator. Thank you, Mr. Tardigia. Um, next speaker, Sarah Kerber on 2.4. And then after her is Felix Huerta on 2.4. 
The Sacramento Transit Riders Union believes that employees have a legal, employers have a legal duty to bargain in good faith with their employees' representative. We believe riders will be best served by employees who are well-trained, fairly compensated, and feel confident in their standing at their workplace. The retention of experienced employees means better service for, pub for the public. We support the ongoing negotiations and hope that an equitable solution can be found and that you return to the bargaining table to ensure that employees are able to continue to provide the best service possible for riders. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kerber. Mr. Huerta, you're next. Mr. Chair. Yes. I'm um, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, since uh, I know we're um, adjusting to some new protocols here tonight um, in chambers, a uh, suggestion I'd like to make is that when we have uh, members of the public that are speaking on uh, items from consent, um, that we have the clerk read the item before um, okay. speakers speak to it that way people that are watching understand the context in which some of the comments are being made it's a very good point mr. Um, Serna director Serna madam clerk do you want to read this item just for the sake of certainly would you like me to read 2.3 as well no that just 2.4 let's let's continue forward thank you agenda item 2.4 resolution approving the terms and implementing the last best and final offer in lieu of a collective bargaining agreement for Operating Engineers Local 3 Administrative <coughs> Association for the term of February 16th, 2020 through September 30th, 2022. Felix. Yes, uh, good afternoon. My name is Felix Huerta. I'm with the Operating Engineers. Nowhere in any bargaining that's ever taken place with a city, county, special district have I ever been told that they're going to try to impose a three-year terms and conditions. Three years. That doesn't happen in the police, fire, anywhere. This is a violation of the law. You cannot impose a three-year terms and conditions, number one. Number two, we gave you a copy of what we were proposing last month in January. The proposals that you have before you today are concessionary proposals that uh, are less economic value than the month before. We are still in bargaining. You cannot impose terms and conditions if we continue to bargain. now. I said the last time, you have not changed your proposal since October 17th, but the fact that the union continues to negotiate and the union continu continues to make concessionary proposals is not impasse. What you are going to do is in violation of the law. And I've said this before, the opera engineers will not stand for it. So I hope that you can be convinced not to take this action and to take this off the table. We have a lawsuit that's scheduled for May the dealing with the 5% issue, that's the biggest issue that we're dealing with. I would recommend that we wait until after that court case in May <coughs> and then resume bargaining once we do not have a gun to our head about bargaining. None of you would accept that proposal ever, never. So it's unfair for you to impose this on us today. I would hope that you would not take this action today. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Um, I don't see any board members who wish to speak. Um, do we have a motion on the consent calendar? I'll move consent. Second. Uh, motion from Director Howell, a second from Director Budge. Um, staff, any, any comments? No? Okay. Call for a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Consent calendar passes. Motion carries at 100 votes. The next item, introduction of special guests, item 3.1, information, employee service recognition by Mr. Lee. Good evening, Chair uh, Hansen, members of the board and the public. Um, for the last quarter, October to December 2000. Henry, can you turn your mic on? I don't think it's on. Yeah. Thank there you. you. Go. Yep. Uh, for the last quarter, uh, October to December 2019, <coughs> Sakati had a total of six service award recipients. Three of those recipients are in attendance to accept the certificates and our gratitude to the uh, years of service. Uh, attending to these three people are you know, uh, Mechanical A, uh, Mr. Min Nguyen, uh, with 30 years of wonderful service. Uh, could you please stand up and go to the middle, please? Second is Reza Kansara, transportation supervisor with 25 years of Come on, wonderful service. Yeah, yes. wow, congratulations. 
And uh, uh, then next is Junior Terry, our Senior Manager, Procurement Service for wonderful 20 years wonderful service. And uh, uh, then there's three you know, other recipients uh, uh, not be able to join us. And uh, uh, they are Ron Hof, line work technician with 30 years of service. Uh, Ricky Jones, bus operator with 30 years of service. Mark O'Brien, electric mechanics with 30 years of service. And we would really want to thank everyone for the uh, dedication and uh, you know, for a wonderful service to the community. Uh, so, Mr. 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 Hold on, hold on. We missed one. No I signed I signed a certificate for 30 years for somebody who is in this room, but may not have allowed herself to receive a certificate, and that's Miss Cindy Brooks for 30 years. <laughs> 30 years. Cindy, you can get away with a lot, but you can't get away without us clapping for you. Well, thank you for the clap, but my 30 years actually doesn't end until the end of September. Well, I so I'll be up here later. <laughs> Yes, we will. I promise you, we will. Next item, item number six, public addresses the board on matters not on the agenda. We have uh, six speakers, seven speakers for item six. First up is Jeffrey Tardigia, then Sarah Michael, and then Barbara Stanton. Welcome, Jeffrey. Jeffrey Tardigia, 5th and um, T Street. Uh, this is where this came from. The reason I bring this up is, Phil, when I said to you last meeting about dealing with the 11, the problem is that, and apparently, although this went through dispatch, you have no parent system that puts in order when you have changes. And the problem was the 11 street, the third street is basically got so much construction on it that you have 7th and T, and the next one is 2nd and uh, v Street is the next bus stop that you have in between there and you apparently have no recognition of any of this occurring although I went through dispatch to make sure that confirming that all of those bus stops in between were inaccessible. Um, 88 and 86 is also not marked on the website that has been for six months under construction so it's on L Street um, through there. Since I only have two minutes I'm also going to remind you on the 38 and others that go to the by the hospitals that it would be a wonderful thing if your drivers had some type of blue protective padding rather than a uh, shall we say series of rolls. I had two light rail or two bus drivers and they had no clue about calling in a biohazard because somebody that was going to the hospital was draining fluid on the bus. Um, it's training that needs to be happening, and it needs to be some type of checklist to make sure that things like this, um, you know, for people that are going to the hospital, uh, that there's some place of doing something to assist better on that. This is why I carry these things now um, of what's going on happening. I have lost my time, so the compliment what is going to be is the L and 14th Street, the barking spots have been marked off. Please do the same at 9th and L for those situations with buses. Thank you, Mr. Tardigia. Uh, Sarah Michael, welcome, Ms. Michael. And then Barbara Stanton, and after Barbara is Stephen Barassa. Hi, I'm Sarah Michael. Normally, I'm in an electric wheelchair, but it is broken. And thanks to aging into Medicare, it's going to be about two to three months before Can I get it. Can you speak into the microphone, ma'am? There, okay. Thank you. Um, 
I'm here today because I need an answer. Why does RT have issue with this? This is durable medical equipment, a wheelchair. I use it right now. I'm all I have. When I need to shop, this is what I use. Some bus drivers, some train operators, they get it. They know life is tough. They let me on. I got into Rancho Cordova the other day. The train operator, though, coming back downtown to where I live, 9 o'clock at night, refused to let me on. Because this was now full, I can't lift it. I told him, let me on, I'll set it off and sit in the chair. He wouldn't comply with that. I can't pick that up when it's full, hold it in one arm, push with the other. I don't have this shoulder. This one's next on the operating table. This takes up no more room than if I were sitting in the chair and someone were standing behind me. I'm doing the best I have with the little bit that has afforded me. I have no family. I have nobody. So when I have to go shopping, when I have emergencies, when I have whatever, and my chair is not available, this is it. Yet you folks stand there and say, we have the right to tell you, you can't travel on our system. And I want to know why. What is the issue? Ms. Michael, thank you for coming tonight. I'd like to have uh, Lisa Heinz, who's in charge of our security, uh, work with you to make sure that we can get the information to the operators. Um, she's in the back. Lisa, will you wave? Um, she'll connect with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Ntoli and then Director Cerna. I think Phil had his up first, though. Go ahead, Phil. Oh, yeah, thanks. So I just, uh, there was uh, um, part of the, the testimony um, that um, made me think here, all of it made me think, but uh, the part about inconsistency, if that's true in terms of some operators um, permitting uh, our constituent to, to use the wheelchair that she brought in today, um, and then others not. That really bothers me, um, in addition to some of the other things that were mentioned. But what is our, what do we do, what do we have in place, uh, Mr. General Manager, to make sure that we have the expression of consistent policy to folks in that situation? Uh, we have a con consistently, you know, uh, train our operators to make sure trade our employees, our passengers, you know, um, you know, you know, fair way or, you know, uh, the same way. I, I would like to ask uh, uh, Doc, can you, you know, uh, quickly, you know, uh, report to the board about what you have been doing and uh, how you try to, you know, make uh, uh, <coughs> a... Good evening, members of the board, Chair. Uh, we are instituting a new training pr um, curriculum for uh, anybody with uh, disabilities. Uh, Doug Cross was, or not Doug Cross, uh, Doug, yeah, Doug Cross was, uh, uh assisted everybody in, um, uh, designing it. It will go over all of our uh, expectations for anybody on the bus, on the train. Um, I apologize. Um, there was no reason that you got left behind. I'm going to give you my card so you can get in touch with me. Um, and, uh, we do, uh, also purchased TAPCO training modules for all the operators, both paratransit and regular operators. It goes through 28 different, um, Modules. One of them is boarding and alighting wheelchairs. All right. Does that answer your question, Director Cerner? Um, I guess it does. But I, I, you know, I just, and it's not just the this instance. It's any time we have, whether it's this agency or the other agencies that we represent, when we have constituents that are communicating um, different treatment um, based on just happenstance, you know, whatever whoever the operator is that day. In the case of our uh, service. Um, that's something that we have to really go over and above to make sure it does not happen. And if there's a valid reason why a particular piece of apparatus cannot, you know, come on our vehicles, then that has to be fairly uh, explained. So I'm hopeful that part of the training is also how the operators and uh, our other personnel are communicating with uh, those that we serve. I don't, we don't know, for instance, whether or not there's certain um, wheelchair types that don't anchor the same as others and perhaps there's a real legitimate safety reason I don't know but um, I, I just want to make sure that we are absolutely treating everyone the same especially when it comes to a sensitive issue like this 
I agree with you, Mr. Cerna. And also, we are um, going to have uh, a secret shopper program starting where they'll be riding along, making sure, and it's, it's directly um, related to this because they'll be checking, making sure the operator's doing their job, asking folks to, to move to a seat if they can't tie down the wheelchair, and making sure those passengers are safe. And Thank in the meantime, whenever we receive this type of complaint, we immediately investigate, we immediately talk to the, you know, the operators or you know, whatever are responsible for this, mm -hmm. and uh, we actually try to do a little bit above and ground. Not just training, sometimes take some disciplinary actions. Uh, we, we, we treat this extremely serious. Yeah. Director Natoli? Yeah, most of the questions have been answered. I guess I just wanted to point out that I think certainly consistency is, is very important, but I think paramount to that is, is utilizing some, some discretion and judgment when it's called for. And again, you know, it's not to break rules, but um, if you have a uh, a single female at nine o'clock at night in a winter night that has a wheelchair, obviously, uh, you know, has groceries or whatever she had or goods, and tell her she couldn't ride the train, something wrong with that picture. I don't, you know, again, that, that, you know, and if there was some, to the points being made here, some consistency relative to where you would be seated or, you know, the uh, chair tie down or something, you know, that could be a part of it. But I, I guess, Henry, that to me is, you I mean, you can train, 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 but part of it is, is exercising judgment. I would think for the most part we do a good job at that, but that to me uh, is a situation, and if that were to occur again, I would hope that we've never had that situation occur like that again. So, all right, thanks. Thank you. Um, Barbara Stanton, then Stephen Barasa. Welcome, Ms. Stanton. Hi. Uh, Happy New Year, uh, Chair Hansen and Directors. Um, I hope you can do ride along so you can monitor your drivers on what they're doing with people, you know, especially people in wheelchairs, that would be a good idea. But anyway, I only have two minutes. So I want to bring this forward. It has come to our attention that not all smart ride on demand vans are created equal. One of our riders was taking the 82 to CSUS to get a 30 to come in town. Uh, the 82 was late and the 30 pulled out before he could get off the van, in, I mean off the 82 in his wheelchair. So he decided to call the Smart Ride to get a ride from CSUS to downtown 17th and K. When the Smart Ride uh, van arrived, the driver told him, I cannot take you because my lift doors will not open. So he called in and said, oh, this person is in a wheelchair, so you'll have to send another van. So we are concerned that not all smart vans are ADA compliant. They should all be compliant. Um, the end result was by the time the other smart van was going to come, the 30 came, so he got on it and he, he went downtown to a meeting that I was supposed to meet with him 25 minutes late. So um, there is a little problem about smart bands being ADA compliant. Um, we did send an email. He did sort of get a response, and I didn't get a response to our questions. So um, we would like to know how many bands since the program started uh, were not in working order and had to get another van or pass up people. So we are concerned about the ADA compliance and would like to know if there's any stats on, on how many people had been passed up or told they couldn't get on the van. Yep. Thank you. Uh, we'll have our staff follow up and get back okay. to you. Okay, thank you. Um, Steven and then Hal Goldfarb and then Robert Coplin is the last, per uh, sorry, and then Sarah Kerber. Is that two? No, sorry. Yeah, I'm losing my mind. Yeah. No, sorry, Stephen. Sure. Uh, I thought we already did public comment with you, Sarah. Sorry. So, uh, greetings, board and staff. Uh, tonight, I'm really concerned about the Sacramento Valley Station project. You know, I'm thrilled with phase one where they restored the original station, 
But it's taken a serious bad turn since then where now the current plan, they don't know what they're going to do with that station. And it's a developer's cornucopia of dream sky rises, including a hotel and such. And grand green visions taking up much space in real estate. And it seems, again, transportation is just getting the bottom of the barrel in consideration for this project. Really, you should scratch it and go back to stage one. And here's a couple just highlights. It's hard to do a vision plan in two minutes, but here's some highlights. I'd like to suggest. One is keeping the original station for uh, ticketing, uh, kiosks, ticketing for RT, heavy rail, the new uh, bullet train, and also Greyhound. Get that in there as well. You could have baggage, uh, safe bike corral. Also let traffic drive in there with uh, right at the front at I Street with short-term uh, Uber, Lyft service, bicycle, ped, coming in through that main gateway. Uh, you have an unfortunate arrangement now with this one level of parking and a bus corral and everything stuffed on the west northern part of the property with this bottleneck at third street and then also you want to have light rail going through it as well it's a it's just a nightmare you need you know right now you have 400 spaces serving commuter rail you want to add a uh, uh, bullet trains to la now you're going to look at some long-term parking so you're going to need more parking not reducing parking in half but actually doubling parking tripling parking. The pavilion going over the rails, that's nice with shops and eateries and things to entertain passengers and gets you to the bullet train and to commuter rail. That's great. But now on the east side of the property, you got to have your bus connections there. All your buses funneling in. Just if I have just a couple more seconds to wrap this up, you're talking about EV charging for buses. So they're going to have to park there at least 15 minutes and ideally 30 minutes to get any kind of significantly significant charge from that station. Being a carb mandate, everything's probably going to electric soon enough. So those are some considerations. And just Thank you. even in this quad, you still have room for high rises and hotels and maybe a par another parking structure. So, so Stephen, the project's a city project and Mr. Harris, it's in his district. So you might wanna come talk to us. At well, I understand point. it's a partnership between RT and the city, yes? Yeah. But the city's the lead agency, so you probably have to wrangle us. Well, I start here, I plant the seeds. Good, you. thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Goldfarb, and then Robert Coplin, and then Sarah Kerber. Uh, I'm here tonight with uh, SAC True Crew. Um, first, I should start out by acknowledging uh, Director Kennedy for participating in the recent SAC True Challenge. Um, I have to say I'm, I'm disappointed that there weren't more people on the board who were interested in participating. Now, I'm sure you have your reasons for it, but I want to point out something. Uh, <laughs> My impression from this, and I know it's not your intention, uh, I mean, I know you're busy, busy people. In addition to your RT duties, you also have your various cities and counties and so forth. I, I understand you have two, two jobs, three jobs, you know, you're, you're multifunctional, you're doing a lot of meetings and so forth. That said, um, you're, uh, that makes you very, very busy people. I acknowledge that. But uh, I want to point out something that the, uh, the riders you know, some of these people are very poor. They're working two and three jobs. They're, they rely on the buses too. They're students. They're people who don't have their own vehicle. And, you know, that makes them busy, busy people too. And let's also recognize something. Those people are not earning the kind of money that I'm sure you people are. I mean, let's just be honest about this. So they're a lot more stressed out. They're a lot more under pressure. I would like to see more of you uh, participating in these challenges and they come up and I hope in the future you'll you'll change your mind and decide to participate um, I'd love to know some of your reasons for not participating but if you don't want to share them I'll understand that too thank you thank you mr. Goldfarb mr. Copeland Hi, my name's Robert Copeland. I echo the last speaker. I want to see every one of you on Little Bus at least once or twice a month to see how the writers are actually doing on RT. Uh, apparently, uh, Patrick Kim's the only one that cares. Uh, he took the challenge and probably won. <laughs> because none of you, uh, 
And I would like to see the rest of the city councils and county board members that are not on the uh, RT board also take the cha uh, challenge or at least write it once or twice. Uh, two, can you have your bus drivers be a little more courteous? Because I don't want to get on a bus up uh, Fruit Ridge or Freeport and have the bus driver complain about traffic all the way down to 19th and L. I think that's disrespectful. And then she, uh, when, she, when I got off, it was right in the middle of the street. That's also disrespectful to the riders. What happened if I was in a wheelchair? Uh, as far as the sack forward, I think you, I would give that a 2 out of 10. I think it's a failure. I'm sorry to say that. I wish it was a better. I don't think the RT can fix their problems by themselves. But uh, the city councils of all these cities and county boards can help. Because uh, what do you need? You need riders. That means jobs, places to go, housing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Copeland. Uh, Sarah Kerber is our last speaker on comments not on the agenda. Hello, my name is Sarah Kerber with the Sacramento Transit Riders Union. I'm here tonight to talk about the SAC-RT Challenge, which we view as a celebration of public transit and everyone who rides it. sac -Tree would like to thank everyone who participated in the SAC-RT Challenge, including SAC-RT staff, political candidates, and members of the public who are just big transit enthusiasts. Uh, we believe the best way to make meaningful, informed choices to improve our public transit system is through first-hand experience of what riding on public transit in our community is actually like. Our winner this year is again someone who is dedicated to improving public transit and mobility options in our system, regularly advocates for more funding for our region, supports expanding service in our communities, and is a regular public transit rider himself, Supervisor Patrick Kennedy. We would also like to recognize General Manager CEO Henry Lee for participating in the challenge and encouraging his staff to use public transit as well. As you continue to serve on the SAC-RT Board of Directors, we hope you will ride our public transit system and embrace this fun community event to help create enthusiasm and excitement around our public transit. We understand that using public transit is more challenging in some communities and hope this experience highlighted how important it is to constantly advocate for public transit in your roles as board members to ensure our system provides equitable access, opportunity, and economic development in our region. SAC True looks forward to working with the members of the board and SAC RT staff in the future to improve public transit access for all riders in our region. We hope we can take a quick picture with yeah. Supervisor Kennedy and Supervisor, Mr. Supervisor, would you like to? <laughs> you, you should stay out there because the next item's for you too. Part-time Congratulations, uh, Director Kennedy. Uh, living three blocks from work, I have not yet found the bus uh, line to service my needs, but uh, there's other ways, yes. All right, uh, next item, Madam Clerk. Next item, new business, item 7.1, resolution, commending Patrick Kennedy will be presented by Chair Hansen, and we still need a motion in a second. Yes, so why don't we do a vote first? Do we have a motion for the item? So move. move approval. We have a S motion from Director Miller, a second from Director Budge. All in favor, please say aye. 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 That motion passes unanimously. No. That motion <laughs> passes yeah, yeah, still <laughs> strongly. Um, all right, uh, we have a very uh, long list of accomplishments of Mr. Kennedy during his two years as chair. I'll just highlight a few of them, but there's about 15 of them on here, uh, Mr. Past Chair. Uh, Unveiled four uh, trains with art wraps, launched micro transit in communities throughout the um, county, uh, helped bring in funding for not only from the state of California, but also from uh, SACOG, expanded light, uh, late night light rail service to the city of Folsom, helped lead the process for RT, SAC RT Forward, the redesigned bus network, uh, received the gold standard award from the TSA, uh, led um, the board to reduce fares, helped with the annexation of the cities of Folsom and Citrus Heights, uh, free fares for youth uh, grades 
uh, under 18. I don't know, TK to 12 sounded a little weird. Um, and then launched Airport Express service um, along with the uh, UC Davis Sacramento uh, service. So um, congratulations on two great years. Thank you for your service and uh, we hope to continue your success as we go forward. I don't know if anybody else would like to say anything yeah. about our past chair. No? All right, then let's go take a photo. Yes, Mr. Lee. <laughs> About on behalf of about 1,200 employees, I just want to say thank you so much, uh, uh, Supervisor uh, Kennedy, and uh, you know immediately past the past chair for your leadership, for your dedication, for your wonderful your guidance to the staff, and uh, you know you care about the community, care about the staff, and care about the regional transit, and you're really a model for all of us to follow in the future. Uh, for the time, I'm not going to continue. Next item, item 7.2, information, transit-oriented development, surplus property update presented by Brent Berniker. Good evening, Chair Hansen and members of the board. So over the past few years, SACRT has been really developing and completing a comprehensive TO plan, TOD plan that utilizes its existing resources and finds creative ways to generate revenue, develop and foster partnerships, increasing, increase housing opportunities, and work with builders that support increased public transit use. Over this time, SACRT has worked with multiple developers, and as a result, we've entered into four purchase and sale agreements. Two of these are with developers that have closed escrow on the properties located at Arden Way and 65th Street. For the projects located at SEMO Circle and Calvine, the two remaining developers have signed agreements and are nearing the process to close escrow. With that said, I'd like to remind the board that this process does take significant time. A typical agreement uh, takes some time for the developer to evaluate the land, determine the risks, look at remediation, work with various agencies to seek approvals, and then find vet investors. This typically takes about 18 to 36 months to do. Once these steps are completed, we enter into escrow with the developer, and then the deal is closed. But that's, this is just the beginning. From this point onward, the developer begins the permitting process, pre-construction steps to clear and prep the land, and then finally the developer goes into construction. And this process we'll see is about 12 to 24 months. So now I'd like to focus on the first property located at Arden Way. This is the first one that we actually closed escrow on. This property was placed on the market in August of 2016. We entered into the purchase and sale agreement in January 2018 and closed escrow July 3rd, 2018. The developer that purchased the land is Community Housing Works. They plan to start construction December of 2020. The project will be a four-story building with 128 affordable apartment homes that will include on-site residential family services and amenities. This next slide is a rendition of the apartments. The target market for these residents is someone making between, or the family making between 30 to 60 percent of the median income, which is roughly 25,000 to 50,000 annually for a family of four. Rents are anticipated to range from 420 a month for a studio and up to 1,250 a month for a three bedroom. These numbers are based on the 2018 dollars. The second property that we sold was located at 65th Street and this was placed on the market in August of 2016. We entered into a purchase and sale agreement in December of 17 and closed November 19 of 2019. We got some good news today that uh, the developer has worked with the city and the city just um, completed the, the permitting process. They were kind of in the plans, now it's completed. So they're hoping to commence construction this month. The first phase of the construction that's planned will include street and utility work on 67th Street and Q Street. This will include building six bus berths 
pedestrian improvements, a new traffic signal light at the corner of 67th sorry, and Folsom Boulevard. SAC RT staff has brought these concepts to the MAC team for their input. These uh, bus berths are anticipated to be completed in about four months. And the construction of this development should begin this summer and it's anticipated to compl be completed by fall of 2021, right when uh, Sac State opens for their fall semester. The project will be a six-story building, so we got a picture of it on the, on the slides, with 223 student housing units, 750 beds, and almost 8,000 square feet of ground floor retail. Due to the proximity of its bus and light rail, this is a perfect location for Sac State students. Sac RT has a student pass with their university that allows registered students, all registered students, to receive full access to our bus and rail system at no additional cost. The next property is located at SEMO Circle in Rancho Cordova. The SACRT board declared this property to be surplus in January of 2015, and then we entered into a purchase sale agreement in June of 2016. The plan is to close escrow by the end of this month. The property has been in the works for many years because of some environmental cleanup work that was necessary to address. The developer on this property is USA Property Funds. The project is planned for 165 market rate apartments at about 21 units per acre. The developer is planning to start construction this year and expects to be completed within about two years. And then the next property is located at Calvine and Opry. Uh, this was placed in the market in August of 2016. SACRT signed a purchase sale agreement with Catalyst Development Partners on May 14th, 2019. Since this site is not near a light rail station or a major bus line, SACRT was agreeable for the buyer's plans for a multifamily residential project. Closing of escrow on this project is expected to take place about February of 2021, if not earlier. One second, Brent Dunn, do you wanna ask a question? Yeah. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, I don't, I don't think I've met with the developer. This is right on the boundary between uh, Supervisor Kennedy and my is actually in District Five. Okay. Um, is is it zoned for multifamily? As far as I, yes, yep. What's the zoning? RD twenty. Not what? sure what the. We can get that for you though. Well, I could ask the Planning Department. I don't need you okay. to run run. The, I'm just curious, and so it's four acres. Um, again, I'm glad to have Supervisor Kennedy today. I, I maybe they get it on my calendar, but I'm just not familiar with. You have the high school adjacent there, obviously. We do. And, yeah. Uh, other. There's quite a concentration of apartments in the area, so it may be appropriate, but yeah. it's on a major street. But um, so why wouldn't we have that information really available? If we were selling it, we should have a listing for the zoning and any other criteria. Yeah, I could get that. I didn't plan to talk about zoning at this point. I think this was just kind of an up, a general update on what we were going to be. Well, I know, but, but you're oh, talking sure. about closing a year from now. So I get, I was trying to get some sense about what it is. Do they need a use permit? Do they need other entitlements from the county besides building permits? I, I think we're still in the early stages. Like I said, we, we've entered into a PSA at this point, and escrow still is, is a way out. This is probably one of the, this is one of the later developments that we've had. I think from um, a TOD perspective, it's it's not necessarily what we'd see in like it's the 65th Street development, right. and and so forth. So, yeah, there's okay, a lot. Well, yeah, I would just suggest I'm, I'm glad to be my colleague because I maybe mean, thought it was in his district, but sure. I would suggest that even the supervisor represents the area as well. So okay, we can fix okay, that. Good, thanks, uh, Director Harris. Did you want to ask a question now, or do you want to wait until? Oh, I just wanted to. Can you turn your mic on? Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment about the symphony development at 65th and Folsom. Mm -hmm. This was a very difficult deal to consummate because of an FTA overlay, and it took, oh, about two years here uh, to work through all the details. I just want to thank staff for sticking with it. Uh, this is a great developer, and I think it will be a real beneficial boost for um, Sac State University. A lot of good things are happening in that district. We've got a new grocery store that will support the student population, mm -hmm. and I anticipate that this will add significantly to ridership on RT. Okay, thank you. Uh, right. uh, do you I'm sorry. Uh, yes, do you want to let Brent finish his presentation? Yeah, the, the, I just wanted to yeah, quickly finish the remaining stuff because I have some new stuff, and then, you know. Uh, it will come I, back to you. Yeah, I just want to. 
Okay. Thank you, Brent. Sure. So the last uh, property that we've been working with is the Floor and Light Rail Station. This property is about 20 acres of land with some great development potential. Uh, we've been working with the community and to get input from the residents. In March of 2019, we posted a RFI, a request for information, to solicit information from the developers regarding a joint development opportunity at this location. We received five responses, which included proposals for mixed use, affordable housing, commercial uses, transit supportive densities that blend the surrounding neighborhoods together, collaborative partnership opportunities that include services for housing, jobs, health, and other community needs, neighborhood amenities such as parks, and other various forms of potential uh, joint development is what they've asked for. Uh, with some recent tax reform rules, it's positioned this parcel to be a great opportunity because this is an opportunity zone, so it will give some advantages for investors. And we're now in the process of getting an RFP brochure together for this. We'll have our standard RFP, and then we'll have a two- or three-page um, brochure that we'll be handing out. Um, we're really excited about what we can see with this area. It is a large area, so we were, we're curious to see what kind of development will arise. And then finally, what we've been doing is we've been working with local agencies to come up with a TOD program that can provide all the stakeholders um, with just our plan for land use and, public and showing that public transit is really critical in this process. This project is anticipated to be completed by the end of the month. And as we progress with these projects, we'll continue to provide feedback to the board through the GM weekly uh, update. So this concludes the presentations, and I'll stop there. All right, uh, Mr. Lee, and then we'll come back. Did you want to say anything else? Oh, what, what did you know, Okay, uh, Director um, Natoli. Yeah, I just wanted to talk with Supervisor Kennedy. He indicates that the uh, old Calvine extended is the boundary. Um, I'm a little surprised by that, but nonetheless, if that's the case, they did meet with Supervisor Kennedy, so I just wanted to stand corrected if that's the case. So they have met with the Supervisor District as of today. So okay. anyway, right. so thank thanks. you. Any other members of the board? Linda? Um, can we assume that when you're talking about um, Mill Station, you're talking about your participation in our Civic Center plan? Yeah, we. I don't think we mentioned Mill Station, though. It's yeah. Oh, just in the in the four properties that we just talked about, or yeah. do you, are you talking about the TOD plan? Action at the end? plan. Okay, sorry, I I was thinking yes. So the answer is yes. Y yes. Let me just oh, confirm great. with Tracy though before. Thanks, Tracy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's part of the. the great. Thank you. All right. Anything else from the board? No. Uh, Andrew, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, I just first wanted to thank you know some of our you know uh, board directors who are providing uh, extraordinary support and guidance in this process. Um, you know, uh, Director uh, Harris and uh, uh, worked with us very closely on the 65th you know uh, station. Uh, that is a, a true TOD project. That is that is the first TOD project for our light rail since. 30 years ago, we built the Dye Rail Line. And we promised the community we're going to do something. <laughs> and finally, we get this done. So thank you so much on that. And also, you know, uh, Director Jay Chenier and uh, Rick Genius and uh, uh, Kennedy and uh, actually you know, um, uh, an attorney, you know, we talk about the, 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 those uh, sites uh, a lot, about how we can you know, make uh, those projects you know, happen and uh, finish it. and. Uh, um, uh, you know, even Director you know, uh, Budge, we're talking about the Civic Center, you know, how we try to make something happen over there. And this is really some uh, you know, extremely difficult project, but uh, gone through the process and we learned a lot and we you know, made some uh, significant progress. On the, and also I want to you know, thank staff, you know, Brent, you know, uh, Tracy and uh, Relay and our legal team, you know, Olga, and the staff you know, from, uh, uh, I mean, Ten, more than 10 years ago, we had a line staff, real estate dev development, you know, a department, line staff, and we didn't really get anything done more than 10 years ago. Now we only have actually just one staff, you know, really just joined us about two months ago, Correct. right? And, uh, you know, Tracy and, uh, you know, and the previous, you know, uh, uh, you know, staff work on the real estate department, only one person, and we made this happen in four, three years. So, you know, I really want to thank two uh, previous chair, you know, 
uh, Jay and uh, you know, Pat, you know, for you guys, you know, really uh, guiding us through this whole process. So, and this is a great teamwork, both staff and community. And I uh, just want to, you know, to, to share you know, uh, this back st you know, story. Great work, Tracy, Brent, and the whole team. Thank you. Yep, thank you. I don't see anyone else from the board who wishes to speak. Uh, General Manager's report. Okay, good evening, Chair Hansen, members of the board and the public. And uh, uh, a couple things. Uh, at the end of January, SACOG uh, led a delegation of board members to San Diego to highlight recent transit oriented development uh, around the new bus rapid transit and the express bus lines. Over 25 elected officials, including our own director, Janice Shinir, plus myself, uh, we participate on the delegation trip. And as you can see from the pictures, we visit bus and the light rail stops. It's a shocking story to us because Sandat, which is the sea cargo over, you know, over there, they focus on the transit and the transit. They moved money from the roads to the transit. And, uh, uh, you know, as you say, we, Sakati, recently launched our comprehensive corridor study where we hope to identify key communities and uh, to implement a network of bus rapid transit and express lines. Uh, Caltrain District 3, Director Amajet joined us on the tour and we had been coordinating with him on a number of projects, including a potential bus and shoulder pilot for our airport and the causeway service. Uh, another subject, the California Transportation Commission, CTC, hosted the uh, January meeting in Sacramento two weeks ago. As you know, the Commission CTC is responsible for allocating funds for the construction of highway, passenger rail, transit, and active transportation improvements throughout the California. They invited me to provide a welcome presentation and to highlight how we are leading the transit industry in innovation and many best practices. Later that evening, uh, the commissioners test out Sakati's downtown smart ride service with a group of commissioners being transported by our electric bus to the next event. We received great feedback from the commissioners. In March, we expect to have some business items in front of the CTC, including the reallocation of $25 million in Prop 1A funds to support our light rail modernization to help us purchase light rail vehicles. We will also soon be submitting a competitive grant application to the Solutions for Congested Corridors program. As I mentioned, we submit a $120 million grant to, the, to uh, Cal STA two weeks ago for the uh, rail yard double tracking project. Uh, next topic, you know, uh, in last week, uh, I have had the privilege of sitting down with California State Treasurer, uh, Fiera Ma, and the Sacramento State Senator Richard Penn. Uh, Treasurer Ma is very interested in helping further Sakati's TOD goals, and will look to identify opportunity zones that can lead to some investment in Sacramento area. Senator Penn is passionate about reducing the greenhouse gas footprint of state workers. We updated him on many Sakati initiatives, and we will be working with him and the Air Quality District uh, to champion a commute benefit program for the Sacramento region too. Uh, then to finish my report, I would like to introduce and you know, ask Brent for update our fiscal year 2020 second quarter performance, including positive ridership numbers and the budget performance. Brent, the great. podium is yours. Thank, thank you, Henry. So financials, great, fun part of the night. <laughs> so we got good news to show. Uh, we completed the second quarter results. And as you can see, revenues, and this is on the far left portion of this uh, 
chart. On the far left, you'll see that revenues came in higher than expenses by about 2.1 million for the second quarter. When you look at it year to date, there's a surplus of about $3.5 million. When we see these results, we're very happy. Some, some things to look forward to in the future, though, is we've actually seen some potential results in the, the federal funds uh, are expected to go down about a million dollars at this point in time, and some state and local funds are expected to go about down about $2 million. We're waiting for the apportionment schedules to be revised. Those will probably be reflected in the February time frame when those are approved by the uh, different boards. Um, but other than that, things are looking good. We also have some positive news coming out of the federal area with a CNG uh, tax rebate. That should come in um, shortly as well. So we've got some puts and takes, but right now things are looking solid. The next thing that's really great news is the ridership has gone up. If you look at the second quarter, you'll see ridership compared to the same time last year has gone up 7.1%. When you look at it year to date, it's up 5.8%. This is outstanding. If you look at, if you dive deeper into some of these numbers, which we've been doing, you'll see route by route, the majority of our routes are going up. Uh, but the main factor that's driving this is the student free initiative. What we found is in the first couple months of doing the student free initiative, ridership grew for that population by about 40%. In December, it grew 75%. And in January, we saw that go up 100%. So, and this is just what we, we saw the same results when we lowered fares for that group. It was something that just just didn't give us a quick blip it kept going up and up and up and I think it's the word of mouth with students so this is really great news uh, ridership in fact I'm going to give you a sneak preview into January ridership in January is already up if you look at uh, bus it's up 10 percent and if you look at rail it's up four percent in January so these are really great statistics when we look at a 12-month trend everything's looking positive in both bus and rail this is what we're really excited about um, you can see that it's, it's up about 5.3% in bus. And if you look at the light rail, it's about 6.3%. And then the last thing we wanna report on is a crime statistics. And you can see that when, when you compare um, the events for year, some year-to-date uh, events, you can see that actually crime went down 14.1%. What we did though in this is there was two incidents that happened at um, the Franklin Station where it was a, a burglary that happened to multiple cars. So it's kind of an anomaly. So we took that out of the statistic because that's not a continual pattern that you'll see whether you're riding a light rail uh, or a bus system. So when you take those out, you'll actually see that there has been a decrease in that crime. Uh, with that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Brent. We have one member of the public signed up to speak, Jeffrey Tardigia. Um, Jeff Tardigia. Um, two suggestions to the general manager. Uh, one with this construction going on at 65th Street. Is it feasible to take and relocate the buses for the time that you've got this construction tearing up and everything else through there to the power in? locations so you do not have the construction and other issues while you are building this it's just an out-of-the-box thought that i bring to the general manager's attention second thing is um and this is to you stephen before you cancel any more board meetings please consider what this board needs to know about light rail cars the configuration the layout what needs to be for, should we say, uh, projects that have been going on for more than a year as pilot projects that you've seen no reports back about either the expense or the results or the outcome. <coughs> In light of the fact that you're saying ridership is going up, isn't it about time that between eight and nine o'clock and five and six o'clock that you actually give back what are the statistical numbers and the route numbers i mentioned those two times is because they are commuter times one is when you have um should we say drivers riders and you have staff present between eight and nine but you don't have it between five and six and on november 4th um, when i got out of the one meeting at the archive plaza 
The signs up there said at 5.30 that it would be 15 minutes before Gold Line would be around. Yet people had already had three blue lines go by in that time slot. Problem is after five o'clock is where dispatch and where is being supervised. So please look at those considerations. Thank you. And those two time peoples would be a good time to see what populations are really Thank like. You. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, uh, Director Budge, I believe you have an oral report to give on the Sacramento Placerville JPA board meeting, according to Ms. Brooks. But it's not my turn. Yep. You're gonna skip the other ones? Uh, I think we have written reports for all the other ones. Yeah, okay. So, um, it was a very short meeting. Uh, there were only three of us and then there were four of us when um, uh, Supervisor Natoli arrived. The only action items were <laughs> approval of the minutes and extending an offer of employment to the lady who has been secretary. And everything else was reports that um, have either generally been through this body already, like the um, street improvements at Bradshaw from Bradshaw on Folsom Boulevard from Bradshaw to Mayhew Tiber and the double tracking in Folsom. Um, we were distressed to hear that Supervisor Shiva Frenson is going to be turned out mm -hmm. and that there's no telling who will replace her until after the elections. Um, she has brought a tremendous, um, she's a tremendous asset to this particular body and we will all miss her. The next meeting is in May and I want to thank um, whoever uh, assigned a new representative from regional transit to this um, as a staff person to the to the JPA because we now have the director of light mail light rail maintenance Michael Cormay <coughs> and he is going to be a tremendous asset to this body because he has a rail background he used to work for heavy rail and and whatnot and was just a terrific person to meet and I really appreciate the fact that he's there now. So if um, Carrie or Don has anything to add. No, I don't. No. Okay. Chair did a wonderful job at the meeting. Well, Thanks. I could say that too, but. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, uh, anything else on the, the general manager's report? No. All right, uh, reports, ideas, questions from directors? I don't see any. I just want to thank our staff. We had a broken um, crossing arm at 10th and O that was malfunctioning. And within half an hour of, I, of it being reported, I heard from a constituent. Uh, staff were out there and got it working again and eased a major traffic backlog. So thank you for being so responsive and helping to fix that issue. Uh, and with that, we're adjourned.